All right, everybody jump up to your feet. There's been just an incredible presence of God here all day long. I don't know if you can feel it, you can sense it. Grab somebody's hand beside you. We're just going to take advantage of this moment. I don't ever want to miss an opportunity just to allow God to impart something into your hearts. Father, thank you so much for just, just your presence that's here right now, God. And we're just so thankful, God, that, that you honor us with your anointing, with your presence and And God, when we gather together, you said in your word, you are right in the midst of our our gathering, Father. And so, Father, we we, we come, Father, with hearts open, with minds receptive to hear from you. God, change us today. God, do something. Deliver us today from our past. Deliver us from a spirit of religion. Deliver us from from the, the failures of yesterday and and, and the unworthy ideas that we carry with us, even into this room today. God, thank you for freeing us in our marriages. God, thank you for healing us in our bodies. God, thank you for setting our minds free to think like you, God. Thank you that our, our businesses are going to be transformed, God. Thank you that our finances are coming back, God. Thank you, God, that we're coming out of bankruptcy, God, that, that we're coming out of, of, of a spirit of of devastation, and and Lord, we thank you that the greater one lives on the inside of us, God. We thank you that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, God. We're the head and not the tail. We're above and not beneath. We're going over and not under, God. You're a great God. We love you. We honor you. You are the dream giver, and we are dream carriers. In Jesus' name, and everybody shouted, amen. Come on, somebody just say, I'm a dream carrier. Come on, hit your neighbor. Say, I am a dream carrier. You may be seated. One more time. I am a dream carrier. I'm fired up, man. The third time I heard this message. It's a good one. I just want to warn you. Just want to warn you. My wife's not here today, um, so I will be constantly throwing her under the bus on many occasions during the message. Actually, she's in Nashville, Tennessee with my daughters. My daughters are competitive cheerleaders and and so somebody say scholarship. scholarship. Amen. So my investment into their uh, cheerleading career is uh, scholarship money. So I just, that's my investment right now. Come on, say it again. Say, I am a dream carrier. You know, God gives us dreams. We've been in this series for the last three weeks. This is the third week, I believe. And if you missed any of the other messages, make sure you pick up a copy at our salt resource table and if you, didn't, if, you, if you can't get it there, go online on Vimeo.com. You can see Freedom House Church. We have a, a, a site there where you can look at everything online via video. And I want to just quickly do just a couple quotes that we talked about and then get right into the word. Uh, this message is really about developing the dream today. We talked about how to carry the dream, what it looks like to carry it. We looked at how, how the enemy wants to destroy the dream. But here's what Frederick Nietzsche said. He who has a why to live for can bear with almost any how. How many of y'all agree with that? I mean, when you know that God has done something on the inside, when you have a why, even if you're questioning that why, you can bear with almost any how. And I like to add just a little phrase at the end of that, and deal with any what. No matter what the enemy throws at us, when I know that inside of me that God has put a why, then I can deal with the what's in the house. I love what Jeffrey Cabrini says, the, the gold medal swimmer. He said, the real contest in life is between what you are doing and what you are capable of doing. That's the contest. That's the challenge. And when you're a dream carrier, you're, you're never going to settle for mediocrity. You're not going to allow the lids of our culture to hold you down. You're, you're going to be constantly reaching towards your potential. You're going to be wanting to, to get past the status quo. You're going to be wanting to live a life that's way above mediocrity. Average is not in your vocabulary. You're living in a state of anticipation and expectation, full of hope, knowing that God is a dream giver and you are carrying his purpose and his thoughts. Here's a new one for you. Martin Luther King, he made this statement, the ultimate measure of a man, the ultimate measure of a heart is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. See, as a dream carrier, you recognize that you are pregnant with this purpose from God and that the bigger the dream, the greater the preparation. 
The taller the dream, the, the larger the scope or the influence of the dream, you know it requires a much deeper foundation. So, so you don't get frustrated when it seems like forever for this thing to come to pass. You realize even if you die with this dream in your heart that it's still going to come to pass. You say, what in the world are you talking about? There was a man who lived with a dream. He, he told a particular pastor and a bunch of pastors around the country before he passed away, he said, you know, I see my church having 10,000 people in it. I see my church having 10,000 people in it. I see my church having 10,000 people. Well, he died and the church had about 4,000 people in it. Now that church has over 40,000 people. It's carried on by his son, Joel Osteen. His dad, John Osteen, had that dream. And how much more did he exceed that dream? You know why? Because he realized he was carrying something. And he created an influence even in his family of dream carriers. And obviously, you know, God says this. And if you have your Bibles, turn over to uh, Jeremiah chapter 29. This has been the verse that has been the foundation of this series. Jeremiah chapter 29, 11 and 12. It says, for I know, God's talking to us. He says, for I know the thoughts, the intentions, the plans, the, the design, the, the purpose that I have or I think towards you, that, that I am portraying towards you. And this is important to recognize. Everybody look at me for a second. God, God, God is always has his gaze on you. He, you. You are the apple of his eye. He, he is, you, you are constantly his attention. He's committed to you. And there's nothing that you can do to exit that gaze. There's nothing you can do to get out of God's attention because you didn't, atter- uh, uh, you didn't earn the right to be in that attention in the first place. Jesus earned it. And he sees you through the blood of Jesus. Isn't that great to know? Isn't it, isn't it wonderful to know that the Bible says that when, even when we were still in our sin, God demonstrated his love in sending Christ to die for us. Isn't that great? Even though I, I, I could be the greatest sinner, the, the, most, the most eloquent sinner in life, Jesus still died for me. He shed his blood for me. And there's nothing that I can do to exit out of that attention because there's nothing that I did to earn that attention. Jesus earned it for me. Now, that, that, that doesn't mean I can do anything I want. See, the motivation becomes because I have this position, God, thank you, I'm going to live righteously. He says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. Thoughts of peace, nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing scattered. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a, huh? Come on, say it one more time. He wants to give you a future and a hope. You know, you can, you can be a Christian, you can be full of belief and lose hope. And, and this is why I believe this message is so important and so pertinent right now in, in our generation is the fact that there are many people that are in churches today around the country who've lost hope. They, they, they've let go of that dream. I don't care if you're 75 or 17, you, you've let go of it. Today's the day where you grab hold of it again. Today's the day where you say, yes, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to hold on to this thing because I know that God is thinking about me right now. Are you with me, guys? Yeah. You guys awake? Yeah. All right, so, so here's what I want to do. I want to I share some practical things with you on the journey that I've been in, in developing this dream. We've talked about how to carry it, what it looks like to be a dream carrier. We've talked about how uh, the enemy wants to destroy our dream. Today I want to talk about developing your dream. How how do I develop this? I know there's something on the inside of me. I know know God has put this dream. I know he's a dream giver. I know I'm carrying this thing. I'm carrying this idea. I'm carrying this purpose, this plan. How do I get it out? I can see it on the inside. How do I get it from the inside of me, in my heart, out into reality? How do I take me wanting to be the husband that God's called me to be out to be the husband that God's called me to be? How do, how do, I, how do I pray for my kids? How do I really see them in, who God's, in God's hands and, and how he's designed them? How do I get it from the inside out? How do I develop it? Well, as I started thinking about this, the Lord sent me over to the book of Romans. Turn over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Now, uh, also there's some notes in your that little hand note thing. And you opened it, I know, you walked in and you opened it and you were devastated. Because <laughs> some of you are like, this pages are empty. Did I get the right note? Did they, are they tricking me? Well, I, I want you to do something for me right now. I'm going to help you because 
philosophically, we just have a blank page to work with. We have a blank slate that we can work with in your life today. Just, just consider that God's dream portrait of you in which you're going to take the, 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 the I'm, not even, I'm trying to make up stuff and it ain't working. All right. Let's just forget about it. <laughs> I want you to write four A's on the page. I want you to write two A's on the one side and two A's on the other. I'm going to give you four A's to develop in your dream. So as I was thinking about this, A's are, make it easier so you can remember these words. That's the only reason I made them A's. I could have made them B's. I could have made them A, B, C, D. I could have done anything. It didn't really make any difference. I'm cool, so I made it A's. All right, so four A's. But when I, when I was thinking about this, the Lord took me right to Romans chapter 12. I, you know, and, and as I start to, I, well, typically, just to kind of give you the way that I process a message and, and kind of get this from God, is I just read the verses over and over again. And I started to really see that Romans 12 is the pinnacle of the book of Romans. And how many of you know the book of Romans is a great book? I mean, if you ever read Romans, j- just all the way through Romans, you could survive as a Christian if you just had that one book. I mean, if, that was, if you didn't have Genesis, Exodus, and, and Mark, and John, and Ephesians, and, and Revelation, if you, if you only had the book of Romans. Matter of fact, if you just had Romans 8, you would be just fine. I mean, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Come on, somebody. I mean, that's one of the greatest verses of all time. How about who can separate me from the love of Christ? Nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. All Romans 8. Well, Romans 12 is basically the crescendo of Paul getting to a place where he has described all of what it looks like to be a believer. I don't, I don't care if you're first century or 21st century or Jesus doesn't come back 25th century. This is still going to be pertinent because he's kind of building up to this moment. And, and as I see that, I see how he is saying, you, you've got this dream, this purpose, this destiny that God has deposited in you. And here's how you get it out. Because Romans 12 is the is the, the chapter of God giving us gifts for what reason? So we can see the dream come to play. And so Romans chapter 12, verse 1, look at, look at verse 1. It says, I beseech you. In, in layman terms, I'm going to smack you and wake you up. I'm going to shake you. I beseech you. I urge you. I'm, I'm trying to get you to see this. I beseech you, therefore. Everybody say, therefore. therefore. Now, when you see a therefore, what do you do? You check what it's. Therefore, so in essence, what Paul is doing, what does this crescendo mean? It means that for the first 11 chapters, I have described to you what it looks like to be a Christian, what it looks like for, for you to understand, for us to understand what it, what it is exactly that Jesus has done for us, grace and, and mercy and, and fulfillment and, and all these amazing things. He says, I beseech you, therefore, 11 chapters, 316 verses of life that he's trying to urge us to grab. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God. I love that the word mercies is plural because we got some sins and we need some mercies because we got some sins, plural. Mercy means God not doing to us what we do deserve. I love that. I love the fact that I don't deserve heaven, but Jesus gave it to me. I don't deserve forgiveness, but he died to give it to me. I don't deserve grace, but God gave it to me anyway. He says, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, and here it is, that you present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. This is reasonable. I'm not asking you to do something outside of the scope of your ability. Something outside of your capability. I'm not asking you to do anything that's going to be too difficult because of all that I've told you these 316 verses to this moment. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Not dead. Alive. Alive on the altar of the dream. And do not be conformed. I don't like that word conformed. To the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Underline the word transformed. By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove or demonstrate what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, Paul is operating in his gifting, 
as an apostle and a writer of the New Testament. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And the grace was operating through him. I, I'm saying this, Paul's saying it. I'm saying this through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one, and underline this phrase, a measure of faith. A measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, all different people, all these different gifts, all these different dreams, all these different purposes, turn in there and say, you look like an original. This is important because that's what he's saying. He goes, we're all originals. We're not copies. We don't want to be like somebody else. We want to be whom God has intended us to be. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. All of us are different. Let's celebrate our diversity instead of trying to be like our neighbor. Let's enjoy the gifts and the talents that God's given us instead of trying to outdo or or, or be better than, and just recognize that I'm, I'm different, I'm, I look different, I smell different, I, I, I have different gifts, I, I have a different idea, I have, I have a different perspective on life, and it's good because God gave it to me. Verse 5, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace, every gift has a grace that is given to us, let us use them. And I'm just going to finish with this. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Four A's. You, I told you to write down four. Here's the first one. In order to develop the God dream, everybody say, I am a dream carrier. You have to attach yourself. Here's the first one, attach. Attach yourself to an established dream. Attach yourself to an established dream. We've been talking about over the last two weeks, you're a dream carrier. There's something on the inside of you. But your ability to lay it down for the sake of someone else's dream develops the platform for you to walk out your God-given dream. And it's extremely important to recognize this because two major things can happen to you when you get a God dream. Either you get a spirit of isolation. I don't need you. I don't need your help. I I don't want your help. I can do it better than you because I got a dream. And I'm going to work this out all by myself. I don't need need any help. So we get isolated in the dream. And that fights against us attacking. See, serving is always a setup. Serving in the now is always a setup for God's yes in the future. Understand something. What you're doing right now is going to determine the size and the influence of your platform in the future. But listen, listen, listen. Don't look at the now as developing a platform. Because many people can use someone's dream. No, I'm not talking about using their dream. I'm talking about serving their dream. Serving it. Giving all. Your ability to surrender it is really your dream. For the sake of someone else. That's what God said in in Psalms chapter 92. He said, plant yourself in the house of the Lord. This is a dream that God God has. This is God's dream. The house of God. The church of the living God. The local church. This is his dream. Establish yourself. Attach yourself to an established dream. This is a great dream to attach yourself to. It's It's not my dream. This is God's dream that I've attached myself to. And as a result of that, he's establishing a platform for me to speak my dream and what God has called me to do. The other part that becomes difficult is dealing with the spirit of offense in the middle of someone else's dream. And you will, you will, I'm going to tell you right now, you will be challenged in the area of offense when you attach yourself to someone else's dream. You will do it. You will. I guarantee it. But listen, offense is always a choice. It's always your choice. Well, you don't know what they did. doesn't matter what they did. They may not even know what they did or didn't do. Well, he didn't wave at me in the hallway. Well, he didn't call me when I was sick in the hospital. Well, he didn't do this and he didn't do that or, or she didn't say this or, man, she was mean. Or he owed me $50. He never paid me back. He might have forgot about it. But yet the offense controls your life and, and you live. Now, let me give you a perfect example of this. I've been through all these stages, attaching myself. So, so when I got saved, God dropped a dream inside. I didn't understand it. It was like this huge thing. I didn't get it. And so I'm just walking it out. And so God brings this guy into my world who, who is very gifted and very talented and, 
and has this amazing ministry. So he comes through my church, and, and man, I just, I just, we connect, you know, we become friends. And he's doing what I want to do. He's preaching, and he's real energetic, and he's kind of funny, and, and, and I just I really enjoy him. And so, so I, I say, listen, man, I'm, I'm willing to lay down my life and serve you, and, and I'll travel with you, and you can go and preach, and, and, and I'll just be there. I'll, armor, I'll be your armor bearer. You know? And so that's what he did. He said, sure, man, come on. And so I started off spending my own money, first of all. I would drive to places that he, I mean, four, five, six, seven hours, I would drive to where he would be preaching, and, and I would just show up, and, and, and I would help for free. Ne- never wanted any money, never wanted any record. I didn't care about that because I knew the dream was dependent upon my surrender to him. And so, so I'm serving two, three, four years go by, and, 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 and he'd pray for people. He'd knock them down, and I'd pick them up. You know, he'd pray for people, they'd knock him down, pick him up, and I'd iron his clothes and, and, and go out and buy his socks and buy him shirts, you know, and, and help him. And, and, and whenever he'd preach, I'd have a hanky and bottle of water and I'd hold his Bible. And I thought I was the coolest thing, man. It was awesome. I would sit on the front row and I was like a dog, you know, like a dog. <laughs> Can I help you? It's like, you know, when the dog that wants you to throw the ball. Throw the ball, throw the ball, throw the ball, throw the ball, throw the ball. That's the way I was like, come on, let me, let me help you, let me serve you. And, I was, and what I wanted is his approval, and, and I didn't understand all that. And so one day, one day, we're at my home church where I got saved. 1,800 people in the room. And I'm there on the front row going, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? And, and I'm all anxious and all excited, you know, because I'm in, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in my house. I mean, this is my pastor and all my friends are here and, and I'm excited and, and I'm here to serve the man of God and I'm here to help and, and all this stuff and, and I'm got my, I got the, 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 the hanky in one hand because he's all sweating and spitting and snot coming out his nose as he's preaching the fire of God and I'm going, yeah, yeah, let me wipe it off. <laughs> Want some water? You know, and I'm just all excited about it. And because of my excitement, I kind of go over the top a little bit with it. And so in the middle of the service, he calls me up on the stage and rebukes me in front of everybody. Totally, totally wrong. That's not what you do. I mean, you didn't never do that. Now, I had a choice, didn't I? I could have punched him. <laughs> which don't, don't think that didn't cross my mind. He's a little bigger than me, but I can run fast. I, I, but, but I also, I could have just walked away. Or I could get offended. And I could live in that offense. I could still be living in that offense. Or, I, and this is what I did. I, wa- I was in shock. I walked off the platform and sat down on the seat. And honestly, I'm going to tell you what went through my mind. Because I remember it just like it was yesterday. I can tell you where we were standing. I can tell you verbatim what he said to me. And I remember going back to my seat. And my wife was on the front row with me. And I just sat down. Everybody standing up and 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 and. The room was kind of in shock because they didn't even know what had happened. And, and here it is, you know, I was, I was a youth pastor at the time, so everybody knew me. I had influence, and, and, and he just rebukes me. Not the right thing. You never rebuke anybody in public like that. You just don't do that. That's just not the way to do it. You, you rebuke people in private, and, and, you, and you correct people in private. You celebrate in public. It's just the way you do it. But what I didn't know is what was going on in his heart. His brother had just died. He was struggling. I didn't know this until the later. He was struggling with his character, with God. He was struggling in his relationship, his ministry. And he just bleh, just did it all over me. Just, just threw up all over me. And I had a choice. Just like many of you have a choice when you've surrendered your dream. When you've attached yourself to an established dream. You have a choice. When offense comes at you, you can accept it and live in a place of bitterness and eventually abort the dream, or you can allow God, the Spirit of God, to help you walk through it. Now, it took me several weeks, but I'm standing here today because I was willing to push away the offense. Now, I'm saying this very important to you because many people in this room, many people in this room, you can, now I'm going to tell you this, you can pick that dream back up again, but you aborted it four or five years ago because you got offended at somebody. I'm telling you that because that's, that's important. You've got to let that go. You've got, you've got to walk away from it. It's a choice. You say, but they deserve. doesn't matter. doesn't matter. You let God take care of that. You pick up the dream again. Here's what Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, verse 12. He says, and you, if you have not been faithful 
in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Everybody say attach. Here's the second one. Align your thoughts with God's thoughts. Align your thoughts with God's. Here's what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, we all have a choice when it comes to our belief system. We can either be conformed to the world or we can be transformed by the power of God. Either you are a conformer or you are a transformer. And this is important when it comes to our dream. Everybody say, I am a dream carrier. You can, you can live, we can live as the influence of the world system gets on us and eventually suppress the dream, or we can decide from the inside out what God has said about us to transform the circumstances that we're facing. You can either be a conformer or a transformer. Let me say it another way. You can either be a thermometer or a thermostat. A thermometer's mercury inside goes up and down based on the temperature that's around it. You can be conformed. Where you are allowing the temperature of society to control the way you think about your relationship with God. The way you think about your business. The way you think about your relationship with your wife. The, the relationship with your husband. The way you think about how your kids are going to grow up. Conform to the world. There's two systems. Only two systems. The world system and God's system. And we many times people think that behavior changes belief when it's the reverse. Belief changes behavior. In order to see that addiction or that habit broken, you've got to change the way you believe, the way you think about yourself. And the way you do that is, what does God think about me? He says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Let me ask you, do you know the thoughts that you think towards you? Have you, have you done kind of a synopsis of what the thoughts are that you're thinking about yourself right now? That when, when you do that and you align yourself with God's thoughts, then you become a thermostat, a transformer. The temperature determines on the inside, determines the atmosphere on the outside. Doesn't matter what it looks like, you believe that it's going to change and it will change according to what God's word says. Now, now how, how do you do that? How do you go from being a conformer? Let, let, me just, let me just take a time out for a second because the word conform is used two times in the New Testament. Only two times. Here and in 2 Peter. Both times are in reference to a connection with the world system. A connection with the way the world. Now, if you are a conformer, then you're going to be moved by every economic shift. You're going to be moved by, by, by uh, you know, the, the, what the news says and, and the way housing is and the way interest rates are going. From an economic standpoint, from a social standpoint, you're going to look at the, the color of your skin. and You're going to determine everything about that. Or you're going to look at socioeconomic, where I live, demographics, everything. Because that's all determined by outside temperature. Or you can say, I'm a child of God. What does the Bible say about me? I'm a Christian. I know what these 316 verses prior to this verse say about me. And so now I'm going to transform my world. The world system says that I have to live this way. God says I can live this way. The world system says I have to, I have to adhere to these principles. God says there's a whole different set of principles and laws that I can live by. Are you with me? That's the difference between a conformed and transformed. So how do you transform? It says by the renewing of your mind. Now let me just give you one hint on how to renew that mind. Now we know that it's the word of God that changes us. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We are transformed by the renewing of our mind. Now does that mean that if I just read the Bible everything's going to change? No. No. Information doesn't change you. Intimacy changes you. So just because I read 12 chapters a day doesn't mean I'm going to renew my mind. It's the intimacy with those 12 chapters that changes my mind. And one significant way that that happens is through what I like to call self-talk. Self-talk. What are you saying to yourself on a consistent basis? Now this is extremely biblical because the Bible says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. 
What you're thinking about right now is determining your future and your world that you're living in. And here's the cool thing, or the very interesting thing. The average person, check this out, can speak about 300 words a minute. I, that's, I can speak probably 300 words a minute. If I get real excited, I can talk about 350 words a minute. <laughs> Maybe 400. My wife, however, she can probably hit six, 700. I told you I was going to throw her under the bus. She's not here. Love you, honey. If you're watching this, listen to this. Now listen to this. Check this out. Internally, the dialogue that's going on the inside that's happening right now in every person in this room. I'm talking 300 words a minute. You're talking to yourself at 1,600 words a minute. Let me ask you, what are those words saying about you? What are you saying about yourself? Are you saying what God says? Or are you saying what you feel? Your past? Your experiences? Now you say, now now hold on, Pastor. Now this is getting a little weird. Well, let let me me explain it to you from a biblical standpoint. In Matthew chapter 9... Matthew chapter 9, Jesus was walking through this town. And this, this guy comes to, to, to him and says, hey, Jesus, my daughter is sick. Will you come heal her? He says, absolutely. That's what I do. And so he's walking with this guy. And you know the story. A woman comes behind him. He's in the middle of this huge crowd. This woman comes, grabs the hem of his garment. Remember the story? Grabs the hem of his garment. The Bible says Jesus immediately felt the presence or the power of God go out of him, and she stands up and is totally healed. Now, Matthew chapter 9, verse 21 is very interesting because it says, she said to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. She had already started. Now, this is what I believe. I believe that she, in order for her to get to the place where she is out in public, which was illegal for her to be in public as a woman with, a, with an issue of blood. She could have easily been stoned. She could have been killed because she was unclean. Everybody up to that point more than likely told her the reason why she has an issue of blood is because of the sin of her parents or herself. What's wrong with you? What problems do you have? But this woman chose to change the dialogue that was going on the inside. She she chose no longer to be a thermometer, to be a thermostat. She was going to, and I think it started in her house many days before she stepped out of the house. Saying something like, you know what? I'm tired of being sick. This isn't God's will for my life. I've heard about a guy named Jesus who healed blinded eyes and and raised people from the dead and and helped people. I think I need to meet him. I don't care what society says I should be, the mold I should be in. I'm going to get out of this house. I'm going to risk my life. I'm going to risk death so I can find life. I began, I think she started to talk about, I'm, I'm worthy to receive this. I've got a plan on my life. I've got a dream on the inside of me. There's somebody that needs my help. I'm tired of staying. I'm tired of being broke. I'm tired of being poor. I'm tired of having my marriage messed up. I'm tired of having my spouse. I'm tired of my kids running away from God. you got to start that dialogue on the inside. Be a transformer. Set the temperature on your life to God's thoughts. Are you with me, guys? Attach yourself to an established dream. And you've got to align yourself with God's thoughts, with his thoughts. Here's the the third thing. I told you to write down four. This is the third. Activate, activate the discipline of faith. And faith is a discipline. It just doesn't happen, Stance. You have to make a decision to live by faith on a consistent basis. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Now, each person on the planet has been given a measure of faith. That measure of faith is in proportion, listen, to the dream that God's given them. When you walk out the dream, listen, listen, when you, let me, let me take it back another step. When you discover you're a dream carrier, let me take it back one more. When you realize that God is a dream giver, then the, the measure of faith, God gives you the faith in order to walk down that line. He gives you faith. Now, Jesus operated in the fullness of faith. That's why he could walk on water. 
Just try it. This summer, go to the pool. Don't tell anybody. It works. You call me. We've got a measure of faith. Right? We've, got a, we've been given a measure of faith. You have to constantly activate the discipline. Everybody say discipline. Because all hell wants to stop you from living from the inside out. From what God said about you. From how, well, his dream for your life. I mean, the devil does not want you to live by faith. See, you've been given, listen, you've been given two sets of eyes and two sets of ears. You've been given a set of eyes on the front of your face, two ears on the side of your head. But you've also been given, when you were born again, two sets of faith eyes and faith ears. And when you hear what God said about you, you begin to see what God sees you can be. And you start seeing from the inside. That's the discipline of faith. Now, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, now faith. Now faith. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith. It's always in the present. Always in the present. It's activated right now. Some of you are getting it right now. And you know what's happening? The miraculous is already starting to happen in your life. God is orchestrating things around your world, even though you can't see it, but because you said yes. You said, I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. I know my wife's coming to God. I know my husband's coming to church. I know my kids are coming back. I know she's going to marry the right person. I know he's going to get in the right school. I know I'm going to get that job. You started activating faith, and the miraculous, the supernatural starts happening around you. You may not see it, but it's already happened. God is working behind the scenes to, to set the right people in the right place. You might walk out of here, meet the person that you are going to work with because you're out of a job right now, all because you said yes. You said yes. Now, faith is, listen, the substance of things hoped for. The root of faith is hope. You lose your hope, you lose your faith. You lose the dream, you lose your faith. Now faith is the substance. Some of your translations in your Bible may say the understanding, the standing under of, of hope. This is hope right here. As long as you stay under hope, as long as you stay under hope, guess what? Faith is in operation. God is the author of hope. He's the one that gives us hope. Everybody say, I am a dream carrier. See, get that, man, because that is what stirs your hope. When it doesn't look like you can afford it, when it doesn't look like people are with you, when it looks like you're not going to make it, when it looks like it, things aren't going to happen, stay under hope. Because that's where faith operates. Stay under hope. Hit your neighbor say, get some hope. It's not on a rope either. So it's... Here's the last thing. Last thing. Last thing. I told you to write down four. You got to be all, simple, all in. You got to be all in. I didn't read this before in any of the services because I wanted to save it for today. In Jeremiah 29... God says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and I will listen to you. And, verse 13, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart all not half not three quarters not 88 percent not 95 percent husband listen to me it's not it's not about doing just enough to get her back it's a hundred percent committed 100 percent committed Hernan Cortez saw the richness and the and the the amazing wealth of the Aztec empire and so he pulled together about 500 of those buddies as Fellow, fellow army, and he got in 12 ships and, 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 and sailed across the seas to Veracruz, Mexico, around 1700. And he wanted to, to attack the Aztec Empire, and he had 12 ships. 
And they were all excited because they were thinking of the gold and the riches and the success and a new land. And so they make it all the way across and they, 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 they got 300 of the natives to join them and they had some horses on the ships and they, uh, they got everything off and, and they started battling the Aztec empire and things weren't going so well. And, and they started to kind of wane in their commitment to this endeavor. And so Hernan Cortes, the Spaniard leader, decided, you know what? We're going to go all in. So while they're asleep one night, he goes and he burns all the 12 ships. And they wake up to the smell of burning, burning wood and realize he let them know. He goes, listen, we don't have a choice. Either we win or we die. You're all in, fully committed now. There's no going back to Spain. We can't go back. Some of us in this room have got to burn some ships. We've got to, let, we've got to realize that there's no escape hatch. That God, I'm all in to this dream. God, I'm fully committed to this marriage. God, I'm going to give you everything that I have. I'm going, to give, I'm going to give it all to you. I'm going to surrender everything. I'm going to sacrifice everything. Because I know the dream is going to set into play an amazing path for my family. I believe my kids are going to change. I believe my, my marriage is going to change because I'm all in. I'm letting go of the habits. I'm letting go. Some of us, listen, listen, young people, some of us, we got some relationship tentacles we got to cut loose. Or holding us back because we can just always go back to that. God's saying, I want your full attention. Because I'm giving you my full attention. Why don't you stand up on your feet? If you're here today, just in closing, you're here today. And you know that you're not all in, but you want to be all in. You know, you know in your heart that you want, you want to give everything to God. Nobody moving, just, just stay right where you are. Don't leave right now. If you say, that's me, I, need, I know I'm, I'm, I'm giving like 80% right now, but there's 20% because I'm a little afraid, I'm a little concerned because I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know what it's going to require of me. Listen, take the full risk. Burn the ships. Burn them. Burn them for the dream. You're a dream carrier. God has put something so magnificent in your heart, so amazing in your heart, so big in your heart. Do you see it? Do you feel it kicking? If you say, man, I need to surrender, just lift up both hands to heaven. If that's you, just lift up both hands. You want to go all in today. You're ready to go all in for your marriage, all in for your kids, all in, all in for the dream. Just lift up both hands to heaven. Thank you, Lord. Awesome. Look at all the people just saying, yeah, I'm doing it. I'm going after it. All in, all in. You may not know. You, listen, you may not even understand the next step, but just, just say, I'm going all in, God. I'm fully committed, 100% committed, 100% committed. 100%. Just pray this with me. Those of you that surrendered today, just, just pray this. Say, Lord God, I'm all in. I'm saying it, God. I believe it. I know you're a dream giver. I know I'm a dream carrier. I give you everything. My whole heart, my whole mind, all my strength, everything in Jesus' name. I give it all to you. I surrender. And let me just pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I know, I know when they walk out of these doors, they're going to be challenged by the enemy. They're going to be challenged. They're going to be challenged by, by the pressure of the circumstance, by the pressure of the financial issues, by the pressure of, of relationships. But God, I pray that the greater one on the, on the inside of them will rise up, God, and their yes will be their yes, God. And Father, I thank you that you will pull them through by, by, the, by activating the faith on the inside. God, they've attached themselves to a dream. They're, they'll no longer be spectators, but participators in the dream that you've put before them, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for, for empowering every person here today. In Jesus' name, that's surrendering their lives to you. Give them the strength. Give them the strength to walk away from the burning ships. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, give, give the Lord a clap and just thank him. Yes. Come on, say it. Say, I am a dream carrier.